thank all of you for attending the, the conference here in Tucson. Uh, what J.D. didn't mention, I'm also the chair of the Quality Management Division, so we're the co-hosts, and I want to extend a personal thanks to all of you for being here. And also would like to say what a challenge this is for me, having the opening session here following what J.R. just had to say. Uh, so I hope I'm not too much of a disappointment or a letdown, but he just has so much energy and enthusiasm. I uh, hope I can maintain that type of enthusiasm for the presentation I have here this morning for you. Uh, the objectives of what I'm going to discuss today are understanding the need to change, breaking down barriers to change, engaging a new workforce. This is one of the real challenges right now because the workforce of today is in a major transition. The baby boomers are retiring. We've got an entirely new generation coming in. They have different expectations, uh, different opinions, different perspectives on what work is. And reinforcing the applications of PDSA, Plan Do Study Act, the basics. All of us in this room should be experts at it. Uh, can you tell me, have every one of your Plan Do Study Act events been successful? Yeah. Right, is there room for improvement? Yes. What, what about the next generation that we're going to be addressing here with these? Uh, as JR just said, though, it's important to keep at it. Every time you do, it's not a failure. It's you're learning that that's not the right way to do it. So just keep trying. I'm going to be sharing some information, uh, plots, stimulating you. Uh, you'll see that I'm, I'm a true professor, I'm a teacher. I'm probably going to leave you with more questions than I answer. But that's good. That's what I try to do as a professor, raise the awareness. Have you asked the questions? Don't accept, don't accept the status quo. Keep wanting to move forward, advance, and improve. That's really that's what quality is all about. Uh, have, there, have all of you read the Around the Bend study that's been issued by ASQ? Future quality. They do this every three years. You know, and it amazes me. They spend all this time and effort in the survey global managers, not only in quality, but global leaders in industries throughout the world, uh, numerous countries, numerous over 30 countries, over 150 managers, they have this study available and they don't distribute it. Uh, I'm surprised, anybody at all seen it in here? I've seen the future study, yeah. but they call it around the bend. That's the title of the oh, latest okay. one. Okay, and, uh, and being on other ASQ committees, I've told them over and over again, we've got to find ways to communicate this information to the membership. In the report, I'm going to summarize very quickly, the managers around the world have identified these eight factors that are affecting industries in general, not just quality. Uh, number one is global responsibility. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into it. That can be an entirely different, uh, entirely single presentation just going through these eight factors. Consumer awareness is a big one. Globalization. Number four is increasing rate of change. That's something I'm going to address in this presentation. Number five is the workforce of the future. Number six, aging population. Number seven, 21st century quality. And number eight, innovation the need to do things differently. We can't continue to do the same things and expect different results. So another one of the foundations of my presentation is going to stimulate some thoughts on how you can become more creative and more innovative as you apply Plan Do Study Act in your normal work routines. Okay, we all know that change has to take place. But what is change? What is your working definition of change? Uh, how many of you in your organizations said that you've undergone change procedures, change policies, re-engineering, reorganization? Why? What was the definition? Do your, does your definition of change as a quality professional mean the same as the definition of change for the person on the shop floor? What about your customers? When your organization says it's going to change, do they have the same interpretation? Uh, we need to establish a working definition that everyone agrees upon. What's the best approach to change that will result in improvement? 
Are we changing for the sake of change? Or are we changing because we've got to make improvements? The old way of doing things is no longer satisfactory. We've got to do things better. Why? Did the changes we implemented result in improved products and performance? Are our customers happier because of the change? Uh, after these re-engineering, reorganization uh, activities and events that take place, uh, how many times have organizations stopped and asked, you know, what were the results? Was it satisfactory? Did we meet our objectives? Or do we just have to move on to the next fire that's burning and address the next issue? Okay, we went through the exercise, it's done, let's go to the next one. Uh, typically, organizational change results in repackaging of existing processes. Products, little or no new value to customer. We've got new colors, new labels, new, new packaging, new emblems, new slogans. Re-engineering, reorganization. I worked for a manufacturing company for 25 years uh, before I tra transitioned into education and started teaching. Every two to three years, we had a reorganization. And the reorganization involved the exact same group of middle managers who played musical chairs. They rotated offices. Uh, they all had the same thoughts, the same ideas. They'd all been there for you know five to ten years. No new ideas, no innovation. All they did was they put them in a new chair with a new title, but it was a repackaging of the same thing. And we wonder why our customers were still frustrated. We weren't growing in the markets, and the employees weren't any more satisfied. Nothing was changing. Uh, many organizations repractice engineering, re-engineering, refreshed image. All right, yeah, a refreshed image, changing the, uh, the presentation, the new color, new office locations, new logo. It does kind of act as somewhat of a motivator. It does stimulate people to approach the job, the uh, requirements, the processes a little bit differently. But still, we've got the same foundations in place. Did we really make any significant changes? Uh, how long will it be before it's just business as usual, uh, not wearing a blue shirt instead of a white shirt? And it's still business is the same. Improvement, it's a term frequently used by quality professionals, but what does it mean to those who are not knowledgeable about quality theories and methodologies? Uh, how many of you as quality professionals have sat down with your employees or sat down with your managers and really explain what improvement is. Quality improvement, process improvement, product improvement, customer satisfaction improvement. There's so many variables there. If we speak in generalities, and just in a global term of improvements, uh, how do you know if you were successful? If you don't have a focus, if you don't have a real working definition, you can disguise uh, the results. <coughs> And if because somebody's smiling now, you say, well, that was an improvement, but really was that your target? What was your goal? Well, we're very goal-oriented. We're, as uh, JR was saying, mostly analytical. And we've got to have facts. We've got to have numbers. And then we apply the creativity part. And that's what I'll be getting to in the second part of my presentation. Uh, common performance improvements. Faster, easier, more efficient, more effective, less expensive, and safer. Those are usually the types of goals that organizations set for improvement. <clears throat> Do all of those complement each other? Can you improve one and maybe have a negative effect on another? Is there a cause and effect relationship there? Other than quality professionals, how many business managers would really sit down and evaluate. We've got to do it faster. We've got to do it faster. But would that still mean doing it more efficient and more effective? Or could we just do it more efficiently and it will become faster? You have to look at the process. And that's what quality professionals are. They're process experts. They're able to look at all the steps in the process. Systems thinkers. Not just look at one step of the process. Look at the global impact, the macro environment macro impact of the process on the entire organization, on the customers, on the final products. So yes, these are all good common performance improvement goals, but again, as I said earlier, 
we've got to establish a working definition, put them in context, put them in perspective of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, changes that require the result of improvement, management. Management must have a comprehensive understanding of the need for change. You don't just change for the sake of change. They have to see the underlying causes and factors and have a set of goals and objectives for implementing change. A process which actively communicates how well improvements taking place. And this is something that, that really I, I get amazed with. Aren't we in the communication age? Everybody has a PDA, instant messaging, text messages, uh, Twitter, everything else. Uh, why has corporate America and the corporate world, the business, done such a poor job of communicating this type of information to employees? We've got a big change program coming up. We're going to do something that's innovative and creative and don't really communicate to the employees why we're doing it, how it's going to affect them, what their contributions are, or what the expectations are from employees to contribute to organizational change, to, to promote and support process improvements. I have yet to see a company with a really, really good, effective internal communications plan to keep their employees informed of what's taking place. And you know, one of the elements of the communication model to assure that the communications are effective is feedback. And very, very few organizations really have any employee feedback programs and get you know, involved with their communications plan to see if the employees really do understand what's taking place or have the ability to ask questions of management. So, that's where we come in. We're the experts here. And there's books and books on all the different types of improvement programs out there. Uh, how complex do you want to get? How advanced is your knowledge? What is your skill level? How much do you want to implement a statistical process control? Have you been trained as a black belt? Do you have good green belts to work with you? Uh, what about trees? Innovative, creative problem solving. The, Russian program. Uh, the list goes on. Every, every year I get a whole list of new activities, new ideas, new applications for all these advanced techniques and quality. And then I find out whenever I do surveys and I talk to my students and I get out and do some quality training for companies, uh, they tend to overlook the basics. Plan, do, study, act. And what I really like about this program, uh, how much training does it take? to be effective in planning the study act for you and your employees. How many classroom hours? Uh, what kind of new facilities do you need? What kind of resources? What kind of investments? All you need is a good training facilitator, maybe eight hours of training. Quality professionals should already have the basics. And then you identify the employees, the group, the team that's going to be involved with the Plan New Study Act. They're your employees. They're already employed with you. All you have to do is allocate some hours. You don't have to buy equipment. You don't have to send them the training. You don't have to make major investments. They're involved with doing the work. Show them that they're important, that you value their input. Get them involved and see what the results are. If the results are positive and you see that they're team players, they contribute, they want to get involved, then I strongly suggest you can move on to something more involved, you know, like Six Sigma or one of the other more advanced you know, improvement methodologies that requires an additional investment, additional classroom training, uh, maybe some statistical uh, software, uh, other types of you know, information or other types of resources to support that. But what I've found in my involvement surveying companies and talking to individuals who do actively use Plan New Study Act, how many of them start with these basic questions when they establish the team and they're going to look at an improvement opportunity? Do you stop and ask yourself, what are we trying to accomplish? Just what is it that's bringing us together and we're coming together as a team that we're going to get involved in? And as you know, from quality professionals, sometimes we treat, treat the symptom and not the root cause which you know, might be acceptable, but we need to know that going in. If we're treating a symptom, we have to let management know that the problem is still going to be there. We're just putting a Band-Aid fix on it for now, 
and we're starting to advance and we will eventually get to the root cause. And that's perfectly acceptable. You don't have to get to the root cause the first time through, but you have to have a goal. Then I like the next one too. How do we know that change is an improvement? Just because the, you know, the office has new colors, we've got new carpet, or we're wearing new uniforms, that's, that's a change. What are the outcomes? What are we measuring? What are the tangible outcomes that will determine if this is successful? And even more importantly, are there intangibles associated with it? And too often, being very analytic individuals, that 85% of the quality professionals that are totally focused on numbers and outcomes can miss the other 15%. You know, what are the intangibles? Uh, less employee turnover, less absenteeism. Uh, it's also been proven, you know, more satisfied and happier employees tend to work more effectively in less accidents, less lost time. You know, there's a lot of, in, a lot of opportunities for intangible results. As a quality professional, we have to make sure we're answering these questions and addressing them. The last one, what changes can we make that will result in improvement? That's the big one. And here's where the creativity and innovation comes in. Too often when we get to that point and we're looking at what changes can we make, we impose limitations on us, mental limitations, because we're so accustomed to falling into a routine, you know, having expectations made of us, not being allowed to think outside the box, uh, make correlations from other areas, which I'll get into in a couple of minutes. And these limitations are, uh, I don't like to say this, I worked with engineers for a long time, but engineers are great at, at being analytical, but they seem to really have limitations imposed because if it doesn't fit nice and neatly into an equation, you don't get a firm answer at the end that's directly correlated to a chart or a graph or a result, uh, they're uncomfortable with it. And that's where the other creativity and the analytical part has to come in to break down those barriers and move beyond that. Uh, we've got a ways to go, but we're making progress. So here's the revised model. It's a model for rapid improvement that was published a couple years ago. It was getting uh, some attention. It was getting some results. I, I believe Motorola was using this uh, after their Six Sigma program. The typical Plan Do Study Act, but before they engaged in any of these types of improvements, they made sure that these three questions were asked. What am I trying to accomplish? How will we know that that changes an improvement? And what change can we make that will result in improvement? By doing this, it helped to engage individuals who were just new to the organization, new to quality, to establish the foundations to uh, help them to understand that they have to set goals and objectives. This is to establish the analytical part of the process. Uh, from what I heard, Motorola was seeing some success in this, and then all of a sudden 2008 occurred, and we had major economic setbacks. Uh, the champions who were following this program and implementing it uh, left the organization, and I think it's just sitting there now. I don't know that anyone's picked it up again. There is some interest, some people have been asking about it. ASQ is uh, thinking for analyzing the possibility of coming up with some additional training and promoting this as part of the current quality body of knowledge, but not much has happened with it just yet. Let's look at the managers before I get to the creative part. The manager must apply six skill sets to the current situation before making a decision. Supporting change with data. Well, Quality is all about fact-based decision-making. And as I said, we're in the information age. Anybody that's working with an ERP system knows that you've got more than enough information. How many reports does your system generate for you? How many reports could it generate? So there's no shortage of information for decision-making, but we as the quality professionals have to determine what information, what reports are necessary, what reports provide value to us to provide the facts we need to make these decisions. A lot of that information really is of no use uh, to the decision making, supporting quality improvement or improvement opportunities. Then developing a change. 
this is again where the quality professional can come in and we've got to break down those barriers. We've got to get in creative, think outside the box, challenge ourselves to stretch. There are numerous opportunities, as uh, JR was saying, you know, there's there's no failures, we're just learning if that's not the correct way to do it. You just keep working at it until you get the correct way. <laughs> then testing it. All right, it's again following plan do study act. Don't uh, provide an overall implementation. Don't upset the system. Don't shock the system by impl implementing major changes all at one time. You know, the company I work for, just before I left them, I've been there 25 years, and uh, everybody's familiar with time cards, punch a time card. All the employees in the shop, 400 hourly employees punch the time card. Most of them have been there 10 years or better. Just about the time I was leaving, the company came up with an idea. Hey, how about an ID card with a barcode on it? When the employee comes in, they just swipe the barcode. And when they leave, they swipe the barcode. They keep it with them. Makes it real easy for accounting and data acquisition when the employees come in and when they leave, right? No problem whatsoever. The employees left Friday. They punched out. They came in Monday. They had their new badges. The scanners were there. They just scanned themselves in and business as usual. I left about three weeks after they implemented that change, and you wouldn't believe what a disaster it was. They were still trying, there, there were people who would come in and then swipe it once, twice, three times. You know, they were expecting them to hear a click or something happen. Other ones, you know, still were looking for the time card. Other ones had that card and they were trying to figure out ways to punch it. It was just a time card. It shocked the system. It was a major change. Instead of implementing it, testing it, you know, one department or two departments, or phasing it in, you know, dual system, they just took the old system out, brought the new one in, and thought, oh, it's easy enough, employees will pick up on it. I left three weeks, they were still trying to straighten it out. Shocked the system. Then implementing the change, as I just gave you that example, you can't make a wholesale change at one time for employees that have been there for a long time, and many years of experience, not because they're not capable of doing it, it's because it's become part of their culture. And the culture of something as simple as punching a time card might seem very basic to us, but that's still part of their culture. We can't change a culture overnight. We've got to implement it, phase it in, and get them to understand why we're doing it, what the impact is, how it's going to benefit them, how it's going to benefit the organization, and the importance of them being accurate. That was really something that was lost at the time of our change. Spreading the improvements, build on our successes. Once you've implemented a change, revise the culture. Okay, you don't stop there, you move it to the next area. Look at other opportunities, continuous improvement. And something else not to forget is the human side of change. We're very much driven by technology and it's created problems. I know I was involved, the company I work for, and in fact, I'm working for a university right now. They implemented a new data system for managing employee or student records, managing classrooms, managing how the grades are distributed. And it was somewhat, it was significantly different than what the university had been doing. So the executives made a decision to implement this new technology. They've got technology driving the program instead of the program using technology to assist it. It's been three years and uh, I won't tell you what a mess it is behind the scenes because whoever wrote the software, yes, it was a nice logical progression, but is every business identical? Is your business like your competitors? Is one university exactly the same as another university? Well, they've written these software programs that are all identical and said, okay, that's driving your business. It, it set us back. It's probably costing us more than it's helping us. So don't forget the human side of change. We should be looking for the next generation of workers, the types of skills we need, the attitudes we need, the ability to contribute to the organization, and remembering technology is there to support them, not to replace them. Uh, supporting change with data, as I said, supported by facts. But what about that second point, free of bias? Do business managers understand how data can be biased? 
I think they do, and they don't, they don't want to share it with us. <laughs> they want to buy us They want to buy us to suit their decisions. So they can take the data to make it look however they want it to look. What about us as quality professionals? What, how do we look at data? We should be looking to make sure it's objective. We're seeing both sides of it. Not just the causes, but the effects. Uh, we need to determine what data is needed for objective decision making, not biased decision making. And that happens all too frequently, that we had the data to support the decision, but it was so biased. Yes, it supported the decision, but that wasn't the right way to go because it wasn't objective. Also, is the data reliable and credible? Uh, JR mentioned R and R studies. They're not that difficult to do. Why do some managers shy away from them? Why do they fear them? It, it's all part of the changing definition of quality. We're transitioning from quality being uh, something that's very tangible, very product related. You know, does it meet specifications? Does it perform as it's supposed to? Is it design accurate? Is it safe? That definition is rapidly becoming obsolete. Quality now is organizational excellence. How well all the processes work together, how well all the systems perform together. Doing an R and R study on a process or a system is actually not as complex as doing an R and R study on a particular process. Uh, but it does involve the human factor. And we have to be aware that there's going to be more variation in human performance than there is in machine performance. And internal data collection should be transparent. Uh, how many of you have worked in organizations where somebody's walking around with a clipboard taking notes? And you don't know why? What's the first thing you think of? Always the negative. Okay, when you're asked for information, how well did the machine run? How many phone calls did you process today? What's the first thing you think of? Yeah, I'm going to be judged. Uh, okay, I, I didn't answer enough calls. I didn't solve enough problems. I didn't process enough orders. Uh, no, the data collection is necessary, but everyone needs to be aware of why it's being collected. Developing a change uh, leads for profits, productivity, more inspection. I always hear those. Is that a reason for a change? We need to change how we do things because we don't make enough money? <laughs> okay. Uh, can we design and implement a perfect process? Knowing when to say when. When do you have enough data to make a decision? I, I worked for a manager, I was in sales for a while, another engineer, and we, we, we had an opportunity, we received a request for a proposal. I put it together, I took it to the manager because it was a very high contract. He wanted more information. So I, I worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. I went back, I said, okay, here's the proposal. He asked another couple of questions. I need these answers. Then he called me the next day and says, well, when are you bringing that other information to me? And I said, well, it's too late now. They already awarded the project, you know. We need to know when to say when, because it was a very time-based uh, project. So sometimes, what do they say, the worst decision you can make right now in business is no decision. That's the absolute worst thing you can do is make no decision. Okay, critical thinking, that's at 15% I talked about, and understanding the process. These are all textbook responses. You can pick up any book on operations management, uh, most quality books, and you can get those right out of the pages. I didn't put anything new there. There's nothing that, I, that I'm presenting to you that doesn't come out of any textbook. Where's creativity? I don't see that in any of the textbooks. That was one of the major issues of the forces of change around the bend. Uh, how do we learn to be creative? Where do we teach creativity? How do you get your creativity? Especially in the business world, in management classes, quality classes. I could spend an entire hour talking about these creative approaches to change. Uh, there's techniques, we've got some tools, uh, the De Bono exercise, lateral thinking, and some of the critical thinking exercises. Uh, they're in the current CMQOE body of knowledge. They're not practiced real widely. Uh, they're in there, but in, in my teaching of the refresher classes, in my teaching of quality classes, I, I kind of survey students. 
And most organizations don't use a lot of creative tools for problem solving. They stay with the basic, the basic analytical tools. But here are some techniques. Uh, challenge the boundaries. And we're going to do a little exercise on that in a couple minutes. Rearrange the order of steps. I like this. You know, take your process map, cut it into pieces, and rearrange them into different orders to still get the same results. If you do the same steps of the process. I look for ways to smooth the workflow, pretty basic. Evaluate the purpose and challenge of why you're doing something. The five whys to each step in your process map. Why do we have to do this step? Can we do without it? Visualize the deal. Develop an ideal state. And I've done this exercise a couple of times and I've seen some published results. And you'd be surprised that the ideal state is really not that far from the way a lot of things are done currently. You know, we're, we're pretty close in some areas. And remove the current ways of doing things as an option. I've done this exercise too. Okay, we've got to satisfy a process, we've got to make something, but we can't do it with any of the steps that are already in the value stream map. We have to generate, think of new ones. And you'd be surprised at some of the results you get when you do these kind of things. Okay, how creative are you? Are you the analytical kind? 85% or are you in the 15% cre creative? I've got a little exercise here. Some of you might have seen it. It's posted on the internet. Uh, it was developed by Gestalt psychologist Carl Dunker, designed to experiment, uh, determine if you can escape constraints to solve the problem. This is about 100 years old. It's not something current. It goes back to about the turn of the uh, 20th century. Has anybody seen this exercise? And still can't figure out how to do it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You know, I've, I've encountered that, I don't know how many times people have seen it over and over. It's not new to them. Connect the nine dots with four straight lines and don't lift your pencil. And even if you've seen it before, you can't remember. <laughs> Never know where to start. Can it be done? Yes. Mm -hmm. They have a basketball defense that's called that right there. Triangle in one. Triangle in one? Okay. I didn't know that. Everybody taking a shot at it? Okay, there's the results. What's so difficult about that? How many of you tried to keep your lines within those dots? Not extending them out into infinity there. What, what kind of barriers did you impose on yourself that weren't written? I didn't give you any restrictions other than to connect it using the four lines. That, that's all I asked. I didn't say anything else. Do we have self-imposed limitations? Were there self-imposed what we thought were logic and common sense that really didn't apply to this exercise? <laughs> I know that's, yeah, that's where we started. Okay, now that we know how to break down some of the barriers, can we do it with three lines? I don't think the three lines is on the internet. Go one step further. Well, you got some ideas now. That's one thing I hear from all my students when class is over, they leave with a headache because I make them think too much. I don't really teach them anything. I don't think I give them a whole lot of new information. I just give them existing information to make them reevaluate and rethink and try to approach it from 
a different perspective or to analyze the data. If I can pick the pencil up, yes. No. Nope. Okay. How about that? Did it say, uh, did I say you had to go through the dots? All I said was touch them. They're nice big round dots. So you didn't have to go right through the center of them. All you had to do was touch the far left side and the far right side. And the lines don't have to be parallel. They don't have to be perpendicular. They just have to be continuous. Are you seeing how to break down some barriers to thought, get creative, get innovative? Did we put mental barriers on ourselves? Yeah, I think we did. And it's only natural. It, it's part of our environment. It's inherent to us today. And it's kind of difficult to break these things down. And then once we do make changes and we implement uh, improvements, managers, the business managers, and we as quality professionals have to really make this point to them. They have to exercise restraint. They want immediate results. They want results. They want them now. They want them fast. And they want to move on to the next one. Sometimes these changes don't happen overnight. It takes a while to gel. It takes a while to settle in. It takes a while to change the culture. American managers, we don't have patience. We want to move on to the next thing. I do a lot of presentations for Chinese managers, and they tell me the same thing. They don't have time to let change set in because they're so pressured and they're so rushed. If it doesn't work, they want to go to the next guy. If this, all right, we gave you 24 hours of problems still there, try something else. And what happens, they confuse the system. They really shock the system, put it in turmoil. Change requires some degree of cultural change. And again, depending on the part of the culture, the amount of the employees, uh, the volume of employees, and just how ingrained the culture is, it might take a little while to settle in. Okay, once you get a success, you should build on it. And I see this all too frequently. A lot of companies do things very well, and they do them uh, consistently well. They focus on the negatives instead of on the positives. I, I work with companies that are establishing improvement projects and general projects. The first thing I have them do is a SWOT analysis and look at their strengths and look at their weaknesses. And then when we develop an improvement opportunity or a project, I let the managers know we should be working on their weak, or, I'm sorry, the strengths to capitalize on them and continue to build so that we have a high degree of success. And we should be aware of the weaknesses so that those are going to be challenges for the improvement project when we do our FMEA or our risk assessment as we're implementing the project, that the weaknesses are the areas to focus on because they'd be the barriers to implementing the change. I can't emphasize enough the human side of change. Okay, it's going to require people to do the work. We haven't replaced everybody with computers yet, and we're not going to. We're still going to have the human element. And especially now that we're transitioning more to a service society, the service side requires human involvement. And as far as uh, human elements, can we consistently program a human to work at 90% capacity five days a week? And if they have that bad day when they're only at 70%, what do you do? You fire them, replace them? Uh, you have to understand what's acceptable amount of variation for the human elements, but understand the human element is still going to be the foundation for your process. And get employee buy-in for the upcoming change. Explain why the change is needed. Get some employee input from those who will be affected by it. Let them know what's going to happen. Communications process. <laughs> Provide regular progress updates. This should come from senior managers. To let, the see, let the employees know that the management's behind it. Management's supporting them. Share position specific, specific information on how change will affect each person. You know, what's in it for me? How's it going to affect me? What's the normal reaction of employees? They always think the worst. You're out to eliminate my job. You're out to get me. Now, keep them involved and let them know their contribution, the significance of their function, and why this change is going to be implemented. Well-planned steps require cooperation of everyone involved in making the change work effectively. Involving people and forming them throughout the process allows time for them to prepare for the upcoming change. Back to quality foundations here, fundamentals, plan, do, check, act.
just slow down, take it very methodically, step by step. I hope this was a review for everybody. I didn't really provide anything new here. The textbook information, the creativity exercise might have been something a little bit different for you. But again, I'm working with the foundations and fundamentals. You don't have to have 20 years experience and have 13 certifications to go out and understand how to do plan and check act. And it works at all levels of the organization, whether you have just high school graduates or college graduates as your primary workforce. Why the significance? Why now? Now's the time. We've got to assure a sustainable success with the workforce of the future, major transitions. I was working with an aerospace company in California, and they said in the next five years, 65% of their workforce is retiring. And the skills that they need to replace them aren't there. And they've got to do something like this to transition if they're going to stay in business. Uh, quality methodologies and tools continue to evolve. We continue to develop them to address increasingly complex issues. The business world is getting more complex every day. Contemporary organizations, global organizations, really have challenges ahead of them. My point is don't overlook the fundamentals. Basic tools of quality, start with the basics. Don't dive into something very complex, very time consuming. I love Six Sigma, but I've talked to more organizations out of implementing it than I have talked them into it because they didn't have the foundations in place. They didn't understand the fundamentals. And I told them it was their money, it was their investment. Go for Six Sigma, but you're not going to get max maximum results until you get the foundations in place. And PDSA is a great place to start. You use your employees, all you have to do is allocate some hours to train them. So that's my presentation on quality focus change for the future. And I think that I have a couple minutes left to address any questions. Great. I have one in your meetings with the Chinese folks. How receptive are they to the PDSA concept? Have they had it before? What kind of response do you get? They are very receptive. Excellent. Very receptive. They're very mechanical. They're very methodical. Um, they implement all the methods, but they don't understand the why. The critical thinking part is lost. Uh, most all of them have ISO 9001. They've done their first cycle, but they're stuck. They don't know how to improve. All they can do is follow the book, follow the, the plan. When it comes to the critical thinking, this type of application, that's why they're coming over here. This, this is what they want to learn. They have the foundations. They want to do the root cause analysis and the critical thinking. Thank you. Well, um, what, have you, what have you noticed culturally within the United States? Is there, is there different cultures from the west to the east to the north to the south? And also compared from the United States to other countries? It's all over the place. Not only regional, it's within organizations. Uh, the culture develops in the organization. Even within California, I, I go into companies regularly, and it takes me several hours to get to learn just how the company functions. Some of them are very entrepreneurial run. Some of them have no processes, no procedures, no methods in place, but they have good products and loyal employees. Uh, I have some that are very methodical in the aerospace, they're in the uh, pharmaceutical industries, and they're very rigid, they're very structured, very regimental, they follow the FDA guidelines, ISO guidelines. It's all over the place. It's as different as, you know, the entire, uh, the cultures of everyone sitting in this room right now. The only, probably the only thing we all have in common right now is quality. We're all quality professionals. Everything else about us, from our organizations, or our personal, our demographics, are all going to be different. And going in to help a company develop that, you have to really understand what's the driving culture. And it's just too diverse to really make it. Like, I haven't been in two organizations that are the same yet. I've been in dozens of them. Oh, sorry, Mike? Bill, just a question about the culture of How is it affected the change in the digital? Just like I mentioned, we're relying too much on technology. We're overlooking the human elements. And we're telling the human elements that technology is driving our business instead of having it the other way around. So that we're relying too much on it and we're eliminating, not eliminating, but reducing the human input, which we 
really need. So I think that's one more. Yeah, I was just wondering, in terms of the human element, how do you see uh, the choice of language or the choice of approach versus positive versus negative? I mean, is it more successful to have people increase throughput as opposed to decrease scrap? Can you repeat the question yeah. so everybody can hear? Uh, yeah, is it uh, more advantageous in dealing with people to say we have to reduce increase throughput rather than reduce scrap? Yeah, for example, you know, focus on the positive, increasing the positive as opposed to decreasing the negative. Have, have the people focus on the positive aspect of it, it. It's always to the advantage to focus on positive aspects. That doesn't mean that you can't take an a negative element of it and turn it around to make a positive element. That's why I you know, encourage the SWOT analysis, because if you get someone who's really trained with it, there are no opportunities, there are no threats, they're all opportunities, and there are no weaknesses, they're all opportunities for improvement. So you have to have someone in there that can always be like uh, JR was saying, that the cheerleader that always has a positive approach, no matter how bad things are, will look for the good side of it and capitalize and build on it. So I, I always emphasize, yeah, look for the positive and, be constructive about what's going on. Um, so. We have time for just one more question. You said something interesting a second ago that, that, that you were not able to implement Six Sigma because of the, the lack of the, the, the basic tool. You talk about the basic quality tools, the basic set of quality tools, right? Basic set of quality tools, basic set of processes, and the basic understanding of the culture of the employees in the organization of understanding why they were going to engage in Six Sigma what the outcome was and what you know the advantages of it would be. They were they were not prepared and even the amount of training into understanding the tools would have still left the gap in the organization not having the processes and the management and support to make the program successful. Not that the employees couldn't do it, but it'd be very methodical, very mechanical, and when they got done, they'd be done. And then they wouldn't see the improvements, they wouldn't get the advantage out of it. The employees were capable, but uh, Processes weren't there, and management support wasn't there. Okay. Thank you so much for a wonderful.